glory, glory, glory. My goodness, man. I'm telling you, you know, it's amazing how the Lord speaks to us and speaks through our, our music and our praise and our worship. I know, I know a lot of times people think, because you're in the congregation and you see how things work here with the music a lot of times, uh, it just leads directly into whatever the Lord's going to speak to us through the Word today. And I know a lot of people think, well, man, that was wonderful planning. That's, that's great uh, administration of, you know, to make sure that it all blends and works together and the songs amplify whatever uh, the message is about and so forth. And, and, and I don't, I don't want to bust anybody's bubble about the fact that Tanya could administrate General Motors or, or whatever and Justin and, and, and them and, and others up here and Joe and all that they're wonderful administrators and they could do any they could do anything like that but that's not what happens what happens is it, it God just uh, whatever it is uh, it just it just works blends right together what what Justin was saying and I know you know you guys were listening to what he was saying and you probably can't remember all the details but if you could you would find that what he was saying is exactly what what temperance is uh, the, the last fruit on the list here, yeah. the fruit of temperance, is about, is about uh, the priority of God in our life over everything else. It, that's really what it's about. It's about, yeah. Yeah. it's about the order of our life being in the proper order, where, where God is our source of, uh, of, of everything. He's, he's number one. He's at the top of the list. And everything we seek, he fulfills in our life. And that there is nothing in our life that we allow to be, to be desired by us more than we desire God himself. And he's first place. You'll, you'll, hear, you'll hear some of this in the word that I, that I believe the Lord is going to speak to us today. And I just am amazed sometimes when that happens. I just say, you know... I know that you didn't know anything about that. Uh, I know you didn't know what I was going to say, because a lot of times I don't even know what I'm going to say, <laughs> you know, uh, until God gets ready for it to be said, and I'm not trying to sound spooky or, you know, that, you know, some like, uh, you know, spontaneously, you know, that kind of thing. But I'm just saying, you know, you guys know, because I give you handouts every week, and you see sometimes I, I don't even really go by what I gave you, and you say, where did where that come from? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, the Lord kind of puts people out here, and I tell you, then he, he kind of tailors what, it, what we hear based on who's sitting there and what you need from the Lord, which is really fun for me because it means that, you know, I kind of get to do something fresh myself. You know, it's like, okay, I've been looking at this all week, and I believe this is what the Holy Spirit is saying here. And I give you some notes that, you know, contain that information. And then when we get here and, and you're here and others are here, then the Lord says, okay, this is, I'm glad they're here because they made a good choice and I'm going to speak to them today. And it just kind of goes down another little lane rather than the one I had planned. And it's like, good, thank you, Lord. Uh, that's what work, that'll <laughs> work, that'll work. Let's, let's, let's do that. And so here we are with the last fruit Number nine, the very last one we've been studying now for nine weeks, really actually 10 because I had one message about just generally uh, uh, the, the oh, concept of the of fruit of the Spirit. But, but there are nine that are listed here in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such, there's no law. Uh, and, and this is a listing of the fruit that the Holy Spirit brings into our life when we invite Jesus in, into our life. It, I don't know about you, but uh, as we've gone through this study, I've found myself at times being a little discouraged. I mean, being totally upfront and honest about it. And I, I guess it's because I can't help but see this list Kind of like a a, a a list of uh, a list of fruits uh, that are a measuring rod, so to speak, in the in, in the life of a Christian. You, when you look at them, you you say, okay, uh, how is my life measured in the amount of love or joy or peace or long suffering or gentleness? And I kind of 
uh, can't help but kind of look at it like that. And then I begin to try to evaluate myself based on, all right, how, 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 what kind of grade on love do I have? Am I making an A on love or a B or a C? And, and to be honest with you, as I preach about them, I, I, I sometimes say, okay, I, I'm, I'm on, I made, uh, made an A on that one and maybe a B on that one. And then there are a few of them I look at and I say, well, I guess I made a C on that one. And then invariably, there are at least one or two of them I look at and said, man, I flunked that one. I mean, I, I flagged that. I, I'm not doing good at all. And, and, it, and it discourages you to think that you've been a Christian for as long a time as you have. For me, 47, 48 years, I've been a Christian. I gave my heart to the Lord when I was 16 years old, and I'm now 64. So I give you the idea of that. And I've been a Christian for a long time, and I'm thinking, you know, I should be further along than, than that. And it's kind of discouraging to me to think that I'm not further along on some of these things. So let me just give you a perspective that the Lord gave me this week about feeling like that. Because I think the Lord encourages you to not, to not look at these things with the wrong understanding. The Lord kind of spoke to my heart about this and, and basically convinced me that this listing of nine fruit, that this listing was not given to come against us and discourage us as to what we are not, but the list was given to us to encourage us as to what we can become in life. This list is not intended to put us down and say, you're not loving or you're not joyful. The list was to say, look at what you can become. This is what, this is what Christ is doing in you and that you can become great in love and joy and peace. And I said, well, thank you, Lord. I'm glad you gave us a list that tells me this is what God intends and this is how your life can grow in the Lord and that's what God has for us. And it's fitting that temperance is the last one on the list up here because temperance are most of the time we call it self-control. Self-control is most likely uh, the last fruit of the Spirit that will mature in, in our life. If you'll notice the list is bracketed by love on the front side and by temperance on the back side. Now, is there a reason for that? Is there a reason that love would be mentioned first and self-control would be mentioned last? Well, there may or may not be a reason for that, but when I read it, I, I see a reason. So let me just share this with you. This is not something that I think is vital, but I think it's interesting that, it, that, that love is the first and then temperance is the last and everything in between is based on those two. You know, it, the, the first is mentioned love and you, you remember when we went through love and started with love, I told you that love was first for a reason. And the reason love is first is because it's the greatest. It's the only fruit that will survive uh, for eternity. Uh, all these other things will be done away with. What, what, what does uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter, say about love? It says, love never fails. That's exactly right in verse 8. Love never fails. It says, well, you know, if there are prophecies, they're going to cease. If they're uh, they're going to fail. If it's tongues, you know, they're going to they're going to cease to exist. If if it's knowledge, it's going to vanish away. Why? Well, it's because we see through a glass darkly now. But one of these days, we're going to see face to face, and we are going to know even as we are known. So now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Why? Because in eternity, we're not going to need knowledge because we're going to know everything. In eternity, we're not going to need a prophetic word. Why? Because we're going to know everything like God knows. In, 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 in eternity, we're not going to have to speak with unknown languages or tongues or whatever it might be because we will know everything that God knows because he'll see us face to face. And the only thing that will still exist in the regions of heaven at that time is love. Love will still be there because it is the greatest and it will survive everything. So love then becomes the basis 
of all of these fruit of the Spirit. Love is the base from which all of these fruits grow. Without love, joy is not there. Without love, peace is not there. Without love, long-suffering is not there, and so forth. On the other end, on the other end we are bracketed with temperance or self-control. And if you'll notice, each one of those fruit of the Spirit could not be, could not be uh, accomplished. There would be no power to, to, to make them uh, doable without self-control. I mean, love without self-control is not true love. Love without self-control is kind of a sick, perverted type of love, right? It's a dysfunctional kind of love. It's a codependent kind of love. And it's a misfit in life. Peace without self-control uh, is it, warped and, and, and it's, it becomes like a, like a silly, uh, giddy foolishness in life if you can't control yourself. Uh, peace, what, what does peace become? Well, peace becomes, a, well, uh, you, instead of it being a true fruit, it, you just check out, you know, uh, and you become complacent in life if you can't control yourself. And, and then long-suffering just becomes a, a, a you know, a, a withdrawn part of life where we don't suffer and, 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 and learn from it. We just endure things. And, uh, you, but you see what I mean? If we want to have the power for these fruit to matter in life, it takes self-control or temperance to make this happen. Uh, have, you, have you guys ever heard of, uh, of a super fruit? I mean, I know if you're, if you're into nutrition at all, you probably have heard the term super fruit. Well, super fruit is a term generally used by nutrition people. And, and it, it means there are certain fruits or, or elements in life, natural minerals and elements, that contain certain nutrients. Here's your homework. Uh, Write down all nine fruit of the Spirit. Write down all 17 lust of the flesh. And then take your a pencil and draw a line from each of the fruit that would destroy that, that particular lust of the flesh. If love will destroy it, connect it with love. If love will co get this one, you know, and every one, and then joy. If joy will get that first one, just draw you a line up to, and then go to the third one. Whatever joy might affect. Peace, whatever peace will affect, uh, wipe out, hey, take it over there. And I'll guarantee you what you're going to find is, out of all nine fruit of the Spirit, the only one you're going to find that will destroy every work of the flesh is the Spirit or the fruit of self-control. It is a super fruit, and it will destroy. Self-control will destroy lust. Self-control will destroy fornication. Self-control will, uh, will, 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 will abolish adultery, lewdness, lasciviousness, wrath. I mean, everything in life. Control will, will destroy that, and so God uses it as a tremendous agent in our life, and it becomes a super fruit. Uh, the term, the Bible has a lot to say about temperance and, uh, and temperate, which is a form of temperance, uh, but it's only mentioned, that word is on, those two words are only mentioned six, uh, seven times in the Bible in six different verses. The Greek word for temperance, and I wrote it in your notes, if you have those notes, is uh, enkratia. Enkratia. It comes from basically two Greek words, uh, in, like E-N, in, and kratos, which means strength or power. So the word in kratia literally means strength or power from within, and it, and it deals with strength or power to control my passions, my desires, and my appetites. So I, I guess really a, a good way to remember what temperance is talking about, you know, we, we looked at meekness last week, and the definition of meekness is um, to, be, to your, have your strength under control. And now this week we look at a word that means self-control, and you, you might be asking, well, what's the difference between meekness and temperance? Well, Meekness means to control your strength, control your attitude, control your anger, control your hostility, control your 
physicality in relation to other people. In other words, when you're dealing with other people, your ability to control yourself, your, your anger, your hostility, your rage, uh, your power, and all of that, and you don't blow people away, and you don't have a bad attitude, and you don't kill people because you don't have any, any long suffering or patience in your life, that is meekness. It's, it's dealing with other people and how you deal with other people. Now we come with encratia, which means a strength on the inside of you that is intended to control the passions or the desires or the appetites that you have on the inside of you. It is what happens in you and how you affect you is what, uh, is what temperance is all about. Very much needed in life because this is the only one that is only seen on the inside of you. All of these other ones are seen on the outside, right? You love somebody, whoo, boy, that shows up outside. Uh, you have peace, whoo, yeah, everybody sees you have peace. You're joyful, man, good night. Everybody looks and says, that's the most joyful person I've ever seen. You can suffer a long time and be patient. Whoo, man, they are the suffer. All of the other fruit are, are, are things that affect other people outside of our life, but temperance uh, in Kratia means it happens on the inside. It's an inside job, and I'm the only one who gets to see what happens on the inside of me because I'm the only one who knows what's happening on the inside of me, and God is ta taking this, and he's personally uh, controlling and moving in our life. So I, I said all that to say this. If you want to understand what temperance is, a better definition, a better word to use instead of self-control would be passion control. And that's what the word is really all about. It's about the passions that are in me, the desires that are within me, the appetites for different things that are inside of me. This is what this gift of the Holy Spirit, what this fruit of the Holy Spirit, I, I, I'm, I'm saying, is all about. It's all about passion control. And why do we need passion control? Well, let me give you a couple of general thoughts first. Uh, I, I know you're aware of this, but just so we can all get on the same page, there are two things that are true right now in this world that we live in about we Christians. The first thing is that we have been redeemed, but we have not been perfected. Now, by that, I'm saying that you're sitting here, you've given your life to Jesus Christ. You've surrendered. You've waved the white flag. You said, Lord Jesus, I surrender all, and I give myself to you, and your death on the cross, I take your death and ask you to, to redeem my life Redeemed means I've been bought back. And so we have all been redeemed if we have given ourselves to the Lord Jesus. Now, you can use any kind of word you want to use. It's not the word that's important. The word is just semantics. How, if you use saved or born again or, or whatever word you use, it means that you have been redeemed. It means that Jesus has paid the price for you and that he has bought you back and now you don't pay the price anymore. He pays the price. So we have been redeemed, but now follow me, but we have not yet been perfected. In other words, we're not perfect. Look at the person beside you and say, you may be redeemed, but you're not perfect. Look at them and say that, huh? Now that's not going to come as a surprise, right? <laughs> you know you're not perfect, right? You still sin. You still uh, have qualities in you that are, you know, out there somewhere, and that's not a real uh, that's not a real surprise to you. But we know that one day we will be we will be made perfect, right? And I'm going to put a passage up here. This is when it's going to happen. Uh oh. Yeah, there it is. First Corinthians 15. Look at these verses. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Everybody say, thank God. Yeah, we may, not, we may not sleep, which means you may not have to die because some of us may be alive when this event happens and, not, and we won't have to taste death. So somebody's going to be alive when this happens and, 
you know, it may be us or it may be the generations that come after us, but it's going to happen. We, we, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed when in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So what is that saying? That, 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 that verse is saying that one of these days, we are going to be changed and we're going to be perfected because we're going to be in the presence of Jesus and so will we ever live with the Lord. But right now, in the nasty now and now, we've been redeemed, but we're not been, we've not been perfected. Or if you want to look at it this way, uh, we have been born again, we have been justified, but we hadn't yet been glorified. I don't, want to, I don't want to bore you with this theology concept, but just so you'll know, there are three tenses of salvation. There is the past tense of salvation, there is the present tense of salvation, and there is the future tense of salvation. You say, what does that mean? Well, it just means that every one of us have a past, we have a present, and we have a future in relationship to being saved. We, we have been justified is the past tense. What does justified mean? It means just as if I'd never sinned. At some point in the past, I have given my heart to Christ and Christ has washed me clean like the power of that blood we were singing about. And that justified me. That, that made me just as if I'd never sinned. Now, that, gives, that tells me that I'm clean and, I, and Jesus took the price and he paid the price and then he washed me. Well, we know there's a future tense of salvation because one of these days, like 1 Corinthians 15 says and, and other verses very clearly say, one of these days we're going to be glorified, which means we're going to heaven. It means we're going to be made perfect. We're going to be made righteous, and we're, we're going to be changed, and we're going to know everything. One of these days when you get to heaven, you're not going to sit down with Jesus and say, why, Jesus, why did you do this, and why did that happen to you? Man? No, you're not going to have to ask Jesus anything. You know why? Because you're going to already know it. So everything that God knows, you'll know one day, according to like 1 Corinthians 13, we see through a glass darkly right now, but one day we'll see face to face and we will know as we are known. How much does God know about you? He knows everything. Well, one of these days that verse says you're going to know everything God knows because you're going to be glorified. So my past is I was justified. My future is I will be glorified. But in the nasty now and now, what is that? Well, I'm in the process of being sanctified. It means every day I live and God, the word means set apart for service. Every day I live, God is sanctifying my life. God is working in me and pressing in me to make me more like Christ every day. So why do we need a super fruit like passion control? Because we're not glorified yet. Because we're we're not, we're not performing at, 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 the, at the level that God wants to perform in our life. And so we need some help from the inside out. And God says, all right, let me, let me begin to develop this fruit in your life. And so that battle that goes on inside of us every day, do you, do you sense this battle? 1 Corinthians chapters 2 and 3. Let me just quickly say this in 1 Corinthians. Corinthians chapters 2 and 3, the Apostle Paul tells you about this battle. He said, inside of you, there are three people. There is a natural man. And every one of us have been born as a natural man. The natural man is the old man. The natural man is the, is the nature you were born with. You were born with a polluted nature. Why? Because you got polluted blood. Where did the polluted blood come from, Adam? As an Adam, all die. You were born a natural fruit of a dead man, a spiritually dead being. Adam sent us polluted blood, sinful blood, rebellious blood, a natural bloodstream 
of rebellion. So we're all born as a natural man. And then Apostle Paul says, then at some point along the way, we get to make a choice to, have, to, to invite Christ in. And Christ brings a, a, a spiritual man on the inside of us. Now, I wish when this spiritual man came inside of me that he destroyed this natural man. I would love that when Christ brought the new man in, the new man just wiped out that old man and we didn't have the old man anymore. But that's not what happens. The old man doesn't get wiped out. The old man just starts battling with the new man and the new man's battling with the old man. And so the new man in me, the spirit of Christ in me, and the Holy Spirit of God begin to battle against the old nature that I have, and my whole life then becomes a lifelong struggle and a lifelong battle between the new man that is in me, the Holy Spirit that is in me, and the old nature. So we need, uh, we need passion control because we, 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 we need to deal with our desires and our passions and our appetites. Whew, yeah. What's wrong with our desires? Why do we have to deal with our desires and our passions? Well, one thing is they, they're out of order. Our passions are disordered. So let me, let me tell you this. In Matthew 6, Right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, you remember what Jesus said? They were all these people were worried about uh, these anxieties and these pressures and these things they needed and, and things that they weren't getting and so forth. And you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. What is that saying? That is saying that that, that God is the ultimate fulfillment of all of our desires in life. That what we need to do is desire God more than we desire anything else in life. That God would be up there first. His position is to be the head and not the tail, to be the first and not the last that he would be at the top of our desire list and that nothing would be more elevated as a desire in our life above our desire for him. But let's just say this. Let's just say that something comes along that, 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 that we start desiring in life. And that something that we start desiring in life becomes uh, all-consuming and, uh, and, and all-powerful and we begin to desire that thing more than we desire God. So now God gets moved out of first place and something that we desire gets moved ahead of God and our life is in disorder. It's not the right order. So our desires have turned our spiritual life basically upside down. And it doesn't have to be something bad. It could be something good. And even if we desire something good more than we desire God, that good thing becomes a bad thing because even desiring something good puts God out of his proper position and now our life is in disorder and that good thing becomes a bad thing. It becomes an idol. Anything that we look to for enjoyment or passion or whatever more than God, isn't that an idol? I mean, isn't that what an idol is? So even a good thing can become a bad thing if we disorder it and put it first in our life and move God down the list. That thing becomes an idol and we begin to want it more than we begin to want God. And so, so because that good thing has been elevated to a position that it's not intended to have, the good thing has become a bad thing because now it keeps us from the best thing in life. So why do we need passion control? Because we got messed up desires. We got disordered desires. And another thing about desires, desires get misdirected in life. What do you mean by that? Well, desires are misordered, but sometimes they, they become misdirected because... Um, our desires become all-consuming. In other words, they become, they become overwhelming 
passions in life. And because they're all-consuming, follow me, we will pursue them at any cost. Even, even if we know that this is not something God has ordained in our life. It may not be a bad thing. It could be a perfectly good thing. It could be a, a thing we know God has given us in life, and it's not bad. It's good. But because we desire that more than we desire God, we will do anything to get that, including pursuing it in a way that God hasn't ordained or even pursuing it in a way that God says is forbidden or is wrong in life. And so good things can become bad things because we make them number one when, they, when Christ is number one and because we'll do stuff to get them because they're all consuming that, that, that doesn't please God. Let me just show you what I'm talking about. I can see you going, well, yeah, that's a pretty good concept, but what in the world would you be even talking about? Well, let's just see if we're in the area of passion control. Let's just embarrass everybody here and talk about sex for a minute. All right? Sex. What, what, what is sex all about? I mean, why, why, why do we have it? Uh, God gave it to us, right? Well, you remember in Genesis 1, he said, uh, you know, here's what I want you to do, Adam and Eve. I want you to, I want you to, be, I want you to multiply, to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. So in order for that to happen, there has to be some getting together, right? And we have to be powerfully motivated for this because there are so many reasons for us not to, right? God, God played a trick. God made us so different from each other. It's ridiculous. And and, and, and you come to journey classes and we'll teach you a few things about how different we really are. And you'll be amazed. You'll be saying, oh, my Lord, God has to put an overwhelming passion in us to even make us get together, you know, because we're so different in life. Yeah, that's right. So what could we say then? We could say, all right, uh, we're talking about good things in our life and pursuing them and all of this and our life being disordered and misdirected. All right, let's just say that sex is a God-given desire, right? God gave us this desire. It's a good gift from God. It is a good desire for us to be this way because this is why God has given it. Uh, sex was created by God for good. And God has given to us sex as a good gift, right? Now, there's only one stipulation to this sex stuff. And that is, according to God, the only, the only uh, area that sex can be practiced in and be good is that that position is reserved for the commitment of marriage and outside that commitment of marriage, this good gift of sex is not to be performed. It is only sanctioned. It is only made right within the parameters of a committed true marriage relationship. So it becomes a desire that is disordered if we put the desire for sex above everything in our, else in our life, like we start wanting it more than we, than, than, than we want God. It becomes an overwhelming, consuming desire in our life. And now sex has been removed from its proper place, which is below where God is in our life, we have moved it above God, so it's become disordered, and now it becomes misdirected because now we'll do whatever it takes for us to have it because we now want it more than we want God, and it becomes an all-consuming part of our life. And so we will begin to seek it in ways that God has not ordained or ways that God has even forbidden in life. Like what? Well, we'll seek it. We'll seek sex outside the covenant of marriage. We need control because this is our crazy life. And maybe it'll involve another person or maybe it won't involve another person. Maybe it'll just be some pornography and, 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 and we've gotten it out of order or maybe it'll be emotional adultery. We'll just start having an affair with somebody uh, in, in, our, in our emotional area of life or sexting or some other kind of perverse way. So, the, so when we desire what is forbidden by God and that, that good thing now becomes a bad thing because it replaces 
the best thing, it replaces God in our life, and our desires now have become evil desires. And so passion control is necessary because we are at war with our own desires. Now, an example of this is right here in Galatians 5, in, 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 verse, in the verses right before verses 22 and 23 that says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Those verses say, the sins of the flesh are these. And it lists adultery, fornication, lewdness, seriousness, uh, envy, murders, revelings, uh, 17 things right there. And it says, these are always at war with each other. So why do we need this fruit? Because this is the way our life is. It's a constant battle, right? And it's a battle to keep the order of our life right and to keep the direction of our life right because it's so easy to knock God out of the position of head and put something there that will become a consuming passion and a sinful passion in our life. Happens just like that. That's what James said, the book of James. Yeah, James said, look in chapter 1. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and he's enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. I like the old King James word that it uses for desire. It says, then when lust has conceived, <laughs> it brings forth death, and when death has finished, it bring, I mean, it brings forth sin, and when sin's finished, it brings forth death. That's the original LSD, lust, sin, and death. And James says, that's the battle. That's the battle of our life right there. And then in James 4, uh, again, where do wars and fightings come from among you? He's talking to a church now. He's not, the book of James was written to a bunch of Christians in a church. I don't know if you know that or not. Now, this is not written to a bunch of heathens down at City Hall. This is written to a church that sits there like we do every Sunday and every time it gets together and it's supposed to love each other and it's supposed to relate to each other and have a body and be the body of Christ. And James says, well, let me tell you what's wrong with, the, with this church that I've come in to examine. You have a bunch of fightings and wars among you. Do they not come from your own desires that war in your members? Holy smoke. You mean this church is at war with itself? Yeah, because all of its members have different desires. And what are they doing with those different desires? You lust and do not have. Look at this terrible concept. You murder and you covet and you cannot obtain. You fight and you war. In the house of God, in the church of Jesus Christ, yeah, why would you do that? You have not because you ask not. So what is James saying? James is saying, look, the reason we need a fruit of passion control is because we, are, we have a desire problem. And this desire problem has to be controlled or it's going to, to consume us because we can't stop desiring any more than we can stop breathing in life. We're going to have desires regardless and, and, and one of the options is not, okay, let's stop desiring. <laughs> Can you do that? Uh, you know what, I, I'm going to go home this afternoon. I'm not going to desire anything, right? I mean, you're desiring something right now, right? Probably desiring here to sit down and be quiet, you know? <laughs> or would you desire, I desire you to hurry up and get finished, you know? Yeah. Or I desire a good meal, you know? Yeah, the Presbyterian's going to beat us to the chicken house if you don't hurry up. Or the game will be on for long, you know. I mean, it, it, I mean you can't stop desiring things. So the, uh, the, the option of, okay, let's just quit desiring is not one of the options that we have in life. So what has to happen? Well, we, we, we have to have a fruit that develops in us, a, a, a passion control, because they're going to always be there. So we got to have something inside of us that can control, that can powerfully control those passions so that Christ and, and our love for Christ rules over our desires rather than our desires ruling on us, ruling over us. So without passion control, we are in danger of allowing the 
the desires of our life to lead us down a road of destruction. I don't want to be overly dramatic about that, but I do want you to see what Proverbs says and just, you make, you, you, you interpret this for the way you want to interpret. Look at what, look at what Proverbs 18 says. I mean, 28. A, a, a man without self-control is like a city broken down without walls. Now, that, that, that's not just a little cute proverb. A, a city's walls uh, was its defense. If a city doesn't have walls for protection and security, it, it, it's going to be left vulnerable to any kind of danger that might come along. Um, anybody that wanted to bring harm into that city could just walk right in. No, no defense, no, no, no protection from any kind of an intruder that would, that would want to bring things in. Any, anybody that want to steal the peace of that city, they just walk right through the place where the walls used to be. So your, the, the, the peace of your life and the prosperity of your life and the joy of your life and the enthusiasm of your life, all of that kind of stuff can be stolen just very easily by an enemy that doesn't have to face a wall of protection because there is no wall of protection. Without self-control, our lives are miserable. Without self-control, you have no protection about what's going to happen the moment you walk out of the door. I mean, without self-control, Tanya would have no peace about the fact that I might be doing something with somebody else that she wouldn't approve of. But because there's a wall and I, 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 have, a, I have a wall around my life called passion control, somebody could tempt me, but because I am under passion control, I'm coming home to her clean and she doesn't have to worry about the fact that I got out of control out here somewhere. Without the wall, you're always vulnerable at any moment to destroy your own life, to make poor choices that kill the people around you and turn your own life upside down. So passion control, passion control is what Christ said we need in the joy of our life and what's necessary in our life. Paul described it this way in, in Galatians. Paul had a lot to say. I, and I, I, let's just look at this quickly. This is in Galatians 5, a uh, few verses before 23 and 20, 22 and uh, 23. I say then, Apostle Paul says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Whew, that's right. If I walk in the spirit... I'm putting the flesh down in my life for, this is what I want to say, for the flesh lusts against the spirit. There it is. There's the problem right there. there the flesh is contrary to the spirit and it, it's always going against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. So what is passion control? Passion control is a tool that the Spirit uses to fight against the flesh in our life, which we're going to constantly have a battle with because these two are totally contrary to each other. Look in Romans 7. Romans 7 is one of those uh, little sections of the Bible that people sometimes have trouble with because the Apostle Paul is saying this about himself. And people don't understand the reason he's saying this is because he says, let me tell you how true human nature is. He said, before I was saved, he's talking about in chapter 7, before he got saved, this is the way he was in life. And chapter 8 of Romans starts with, uh, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And then he starts saying, I thank God through Jesus Christ that he's delivered me because this is the way I was. And notice what he says. For what I am doing, I don't understand. For what I will do, uh, will to do, I, I don't practice what I will to do, but, but I practice what I hate. That's what I do. Does that sound familiar to anybody? 
For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I, I don't find. For the good that I will do, I, I don't do that, but the evil that I will not do, that's what I practice. So the Apostle Paul says, let me tell you how humanity is. Humanity is is, is a contrary walk to the things of God. It's, it's normal, it's natural for human beings to want to behave one way, but to actually behave another way. I mean, it, it's purely human to try to do right and, and end up doing wrong. I mean, it, it's human to be totally out of control in life. So the only way to get real self-control in life is to, it is to lose self-control. I know that sounds so confusing in life. But the only way to get real self-control is to give up that, 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 that powerless self-control that we have in our own life that we think we're in charge. Isn't that, isn't that what Christianity is all about, really? Isn't that what following the gospel is? Is that we lose our old nature and we take on a new nature? I mean, isn't that what it is? You say, man, how can I have this, 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 this passion control? I, I, I don't have it within myself. I, well, no, you don't have it within yourself. So what do you have to do? Well, you have to receive in you a, a nature that does have true control in it. To give up my old nature and get a new nature, a strong nature, an overpowering nature, a nature that identifies with him. Christ hung on a cross until he was until his body was dead. Why did he do that? To make a payment to cover my sin. And so in, in our identifying with him, the Bible says that we must crucify ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow him. So what does crucifying yourself involve? Well, it doesn't mean I go to the Roman government and say, you know, here, uh, I want to identify with Jesus, so I want you to take my flesh and I want you to nail it up on a cross and hang me out there in, in, in the middle of the city square somewhere. No, no, that's not crucifying yourself. Crucifying yourself means I die to myself on the inside. It means I wave the white flag. It means I surrender my desires, my wants. It means I ask Christ to come alive in me every day and to, and to spiritually crucify and humble that old part of me and let himself come alive. So we've been studying the fruit of the Spirit in verses 22 and 23 for nine weeks now. Would you like to know what verse 24 has to say, the very next verse? We've been looking at verse 22 and 23 every Sunday, right? We, we haven't looked at the next verse. Look at Look at the next verse. Uh, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and, and desires. That's, that's, that's the key to that thing. I mean, there it is. There, there's, there's the answer to how to have passion control. Replace the human nature with a spirit nature. You know, I said that, that, that the word temperance means a control from within, a, a power from within. Well, where does that power come from? It's not our power. I think we've already seen that. We can't produce this power. It's a power produced by the Spirit of God. So how do you, how do you have this power in you? Well, you have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, and if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So... Every fruit of the Spirit is based on the fact that, that we have brought into our life God's nature and we have eliminated out of our life our human nature. I mean, you can't have uh, love. Lo love, is, love is not an aspect of humanity. I mean, true love, real love, is not an aspect of humanity. That's contrary to what humans are normally like, or joy, or peace, or long-suffering, or gentleness, or goodness, or faith. I mean, those things are not common to human nature. They're aspects of spirit nature. And so Paul says, since we live by the Spirit, man, we need to walk in the Spirit. 
It goes against human reasoning to say in order to have a true self-control, you got to lose self-control. That, that seems to be a contrary thought just as much as it goes against human reasoning to say in order to live, you got to die, but that's what you got to do. Jesus died in order for men to live. He gave himself on a cross and accepted death. Nobody killed Jesus. He gave himself up. And he accepted death. Why? Because of his great love for us. And when he accepted that death on the cross, he made it possible for all of us to have life. So to be born again, to be redeemed, to be justified, choose your word. We willingly must crucify the sinful man that we were born with. We have to put him to death by willingly surrendering to Jesus, who hung on a cross to give us life willingly and gave himself up willingly so that we could come alive. And when we surrender our old nature willingly on purpose to his new nature and wave the white flag and say, Jesus, uh, I give it up. Uh, come into my life. Take control of me. When we do that, we're made alive in him and the Holy Spirit comes and lives on the inside of us. And his Holy Spirit living on the inside of us begins to change our nature. And as the Spirit does its work, our human nature begins to lose control and the spirit nature begins to take control. And that begins to show uh, uh, certain results in our lives. And the, and the results that it shows in our life is what we've been studying the last nine weeks. The fruit of the spirit. They begin to motivate out of our life. They begin to move out of our life as the Holy Spirit is the power within us to bring all of these fruit alive in our life. You'll never have enough control within yourself to control your desires and your human nature and all of these things. It's just too powerful. That's why the whole emphasis of the Word of God is that we would give up our nature and let His nature come in so that His powerful nature can begin to develop fruit in our life that can protect us from ourselves and that can lead us to greatness and with the Lord and the values of life. Because right now, you're living in a sinful world that is filled with temptation. And you're not going to be taken out of this world until God is finished with you on this earth. And as long as you live on this earth, you are going to be tempted. Temptation is not a sin. Anybody can be tempted. I mean, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all forms, just as we are, yet without sin. So the Bible says that Jesus was tempted, and if tempted was a sin, how could it say Jesus was tempted, but he didn't live with any sin? Temptation's not a sin. Yielding to temptation would be the sin, and you're going to be tempted all the time. And without, without passion control, you're going to be vulnerable to every temptation. At any moment, you could do something stupid and destroy your whole life. Kill your marriage, hurt your children, you know, ruin your life. Self-control. It's a powerful, powerful protector of your life. So, all right, let's, let's bow our head. I think that's enough of that. All right, let's bow our heads again.